continue now our lecture by studying the visual cortex where uh, after the eyes information is propagated to uh, LGN which is uh, more like a relay station and then conveyed directly into the visual cortex. The visual cortex uh, is usually divided into a two areas. Uh, there's a ventral stream, the shape pathways or the object cat pathways or the what pathway. And there's a dorsal stream motion pathway, the wear pathway also. This has been divided by um, you know, Wikipedia and uh, in particular uh, these two researchers um, a long time ago. Um, in this course, we mostly focus and work on the ventral pathway, so the pathway of what, what kind of objects, because we're interested in um, understanding the scenes in the context of, uh, of what is in the scene. Um, nevertheless, uh, both pathways occur, processing occurs at the same time, and both processing is mixed together to, uh, to report our visual experience. So we should not neglect the second portion of the models, but um, we'll have to st we'll start uh, in this course with the ventral pathway. So the visual cortex uh, of the ventral pathways, or in general the whole visual cortex, is quite a complex, um, quite a complex arrangement of areas. So here you can see a diagram by Feldman and Van Essen in 91 that just shows you what kind of connection, what kind of brain area and connections uh, there are. You don't have to worry about all the names here. You might recognize V1, uh, V2, uh, V4. Um, you might recognize the part of IT uh, and so forth. Um, there's many other areas that the Meyer might not um, you know, be important to to be represented in, in this first model in here. I just wanted to give you an idea. This model really doesn't tell you anything of how information is processed or how in the brain might be organized. It just gives you an anatomical description of the connections though. But it's interesting to notice that uh, a lot of this area have diversified uh, um, uh, capabilities. Um, in, if we want to understand each one of these areas, um, we will need to develop uh, biomedical instrumentation that allows you to record from the brain, in particular that allows to record receptive fields, so thousands of neurons in parallel and their output as well. It's something that we really don't have right now, uh, and in fact we have a really good knowledge about V1, um, LGN, the retina, because we can probe it easily, but as we go in in V2 or V4, um, our knowledge um, becomes a little sparser and more crude because we just don't have scientific tools and instrument to allow us to study these things. Uh, this is a, a diagram that I borrowed from Thomas Serre, a colleague at Brown, which is a really one of the major experts in this area. And uh, <coughs> it shows you uh, one of the models that uh, we're gonna use uh, heavily in this course, which is a model of how our brain and the ventral pathway uh, might um, understand what's in the visual scene and categorize objects. Uh, so it, it briefly describes a visual area, you know, in v V1, V4, V1, V2, V4, inferotemporal cortex, and uh, maybe behavioral, you know, pre after prefrontal cortex and, and so forth. It tells you how information, uh, visual information is processed. It gives you a model of how this information might be processed in the human brain. And the main idea, and it's not just this idea, um, there's a lot of people that have, have been involved uh, uh, for many years, uh, including Jan um, uh, Khan and uh, uh, Fukushima that uh, sort of uh, thought about this models like this, but a lot of uh, visual neuroscience models is basically represented, <coughs> um, basically has the same kind of model arrangement. We know that we have, um, you know, if we look at an area like this, we know that information comes in and there goes into some area called V1, area called V2, uh, and then goes to V4, and then goes to say MIT. So we know that there's a, a lay multiple layers of processing uh, of information and, and the idea is that um, most probably 
given the knowledge that we have from neuroscience um, and thinking about the problem, you know, maybe one of the best description of it is uh, that uh, all these layers, um, they uh, look at different parts of the visual scene, different parts of the image. At the beginning, with the small receptive field, and as they go in, the receptive field becomes bigger, so these cir circles become bigger, so they represent more and more of this image uh, from, you know, up to here could be a big chunk of this image um, in, in IT. Um, and uh, as, as they go in, um, each one of these models is a hierarchical model that has a receptive fields. So uh, this uh, neuron in this area, you know, could be V1, for example, uh, gets input from all these cells here. And then this neuron here could be V2, gets input from all of these cells here. So each one has a hierarchical sort of pyramid model where information is aggregated more and more into larger portion of the image. If you think about it, uh, some of this um, this information, for example, in the small you know small patches of the image could be information about edges. Uh, these edges could be combined into edge that um, you know it's more uh, independent of the position or really the size, the thickness of this edge, for example, or the size of this edge. Um, and then you can keep going and grouping feature more, more, more and more complicated features. For example, eyes. You know, you could have um, you know feature here that represents an eye, and here you could have a feature that represents a face, and here you have a feature that represents an entire uh, person, for example. And so this is the hierarchical model. Um, another slide from Thomas Serre. Uh, it shows you more or less uh, the simplified model that we think about. You know, is that uh, after the information arrives in V1, after just uh, 10 milliseconds or so, uh, information is propagated to V4. Um, might take 40 milliseconds for it to uh, get an input. Uh, each one of these area might uh, send might um, send a, a feedback and then uh, this whole neural network will stabilize uh, if there is enough time. Um, <coughs> but they're basically, you know, within uh, 200 milliseconds or just milliseconds or so, you get really a response, you know what you're looking at. Um, and so Simon Torp, which is um, uh, one of the famous neuroscientists in this area, has figured out that maybe a lot of the processing um, happens in a feed-forward way. So if you do rapid categorization, means if, if I just present you this image for like a few hundred milliseconds or a hundred milliseconds, you just don't have enough time maybe for feedback to propagate. And uh, I tell you to uh, click whether there's an animal or not. Uh, and he saw that basically mm, uh, a human response could happen be between you know, in 200 milliseconds, which, uh, you know, it's probably not enough time for all of this layer to respond and then to also send feedback, uh, multi send feedback here and adjust uh, their um, response again based on uh, the upper layer and so forth. So they think a lot of this information just flows, at least for rapid categorization, mainly in one way uh, to give you a response of what you're seeing. Uh, and then there could be some feedback that happens, uh, you know, on a, a smaller time scale, basically. Um, so just to give you an idea of what each one of what these areas does, um, the V1 area has a simple and complex cells in the brain uh, that, for example, respond to, uh, you know, a line, a uh, you know, white line on a dark background, for example. Uh, only in a specific position, but if it's another position, another orientation, or if it's too big, if it's too big of a line, it just doesn't respond much. <coughs> a complex cell um, instead uh, basically um, respond to um, a bar in a specific location and to motion only in, a, in one direction, but not in the other direction. Um, and you know, usually in um, in the context of this class, we will think about the V1 area as uh, uh, creating receptive field that are sort of like a bore filters, so uh, they can receive lines that are uh, 
white lines on a dark background or vice versa. Uh, they have a specific orientation and, uh, and a position in the receptive fields. So th this is a sort of a, like a larger receptive field that is synthetically created, but the real receptive field is just the little portion here that responds um, to these things. <coughs> Area V2, uh, it's more difficult to understand exactly what the processing is, again, for lack of tools. A lot of the cells in, in, uh, v, in the V2 area are similar to V1 area, so they reproduce uh, similar responses to, uh, to edges, motion, and so forth. But one interesting thing that uh, was recently discovered is that uh, some cell in the V2 area um, are uh, called the border ownership cells, and they respond to sort of the idea of where is an object. So if you look at this illusion here, there's a vase or a face or two faces, and you will only be able to see either the vase or the faces at a certain time. Your brain can only process one um, appearance of, um, of the image at a, at a time. Um, so, you know, does this border here um, uh, um, belong to the face, or does this belong to the vase? And it really depends whether you think the vase is the foreground object and the and the dark part is the background, or vice versa, if you think that the dark part is the foreground object and the white part is the, is the background. Um, and they found a cell that basically encode, um, uh, give, give a response basically um, whether uh, they know that the, the object is uh, on the right and they give you more response. If you put the object on, on the left, but the receptive field of, uh, of those cells remain exactly the same. So this circle is the receptive field. Uh, they won't respond as high. Um, and so uh, they are able to basically tell you whether uh, you know, this edge belongs to, to an object on, on a specific side or not. <coughs> uh, and they're quite interesting. Uh, the cells like this uh, that uh, do complex processing uh, in V2 um, and uh, if we had better neuroscience too, we would know more information. In the V4 area, V4 is uh, getting more more complex information about the input. So it's, you know, usually aggregates a more complex shape. It could be triangle shapes, you know, like an eye, like uh, uh, two, two lines could form a corner or uh, form a T-junction or so forth. So V4 could be tuned to some of this, and these are recordings that have been done, you know, about ten years ago. Or so, in the V4 area, and it, and these are sort of uh, some of the plausible receptive field that uh, can occur. So you can see what kind of a shapes. You know, it's not line anymore, but it's some curved shapes or T shape or some more complex uh, shape. And this, you know, a lot of these um, again, these experiments were crude because of the lack of, you know, large um, capabilities in in uh, biomedical instrumentation, but they're getting better with some optical techniques. Uh, and uh, maybe in the future we'll be able to explain more of what the V4 does. <coughs> Finally, in the inferotemporal cortex, for example, this or al almost at the edge of uh, the ventral pathway, as we, as we consider it, uh, there might be cell that responds to very complex objects. And you know, some of these experiments that have been done by Christoph Kropf and Kreiman and Freyd you know, again, about uh, 10 years ago, they found a neuron in, uh, in a patient that was monitored that, neuro neurosurg that had to go undergo a neurosurgical operation and then was monitored. They found neurons that respond only, for example, to uh, Clinton's image, Clinton face. So they, con they found a Clinton neuron, for example, they were really famous at the time. And it doesn't matter whether it's a cartoon or not a cartoon, and you can show him any other image or any other press, they don't respond, they only respond to, to a specific phase. And that means that in IT there are cells that are really tuned to more complex objects. You know, for example, the face of a, a, a person that you see very often uh, and, and, st and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, and this is what, you know, we think it's in IT. Um, and by all means, uh, the visual cortex, uh, as is explained here, is just to give you a brief introduction from about how we're going to use and model in this class. Uh, you know, you would need maybe one or multiple 
classes just to teach you all of these things. But if some of you are interested, I really uh, recommend you to read for your benefit, read more, delve more into this. And I give you some link. This is a review article by Di Carlo from, from last year that is extremely good, um, especially um, all the references. Make sure that you read this article and also read as many references as you, you have time. Uh, there's also lots of information on, you know, on, on the web, on Wikipedia and so forth. Uh, um, there's neuroscience books. Uh, not a lot of uh, the latest information is propagated there. So um, I really recommend you to, to read a lot of these uh, references of these articles. If you do that, you will understand why, you know, mo areas like this, for example, V1, V2, uh, V4, and IT, uh, might be able to um, to give you a better, better model. Yeah, so on one side we have neuroscience. Neuroscience can uh, give us experiments that can really tell us how our brain works. Um, on, th on the other side we have synthetic model like the one that we're going to work on in this class. Um, and the idea is that synthetic models should, uh, you know, at least to my view is that they should represent uh, the basic uh, information processing in the brain um, without uh, being hindered by complexity in modeling the, the biological system. What we really care about is how do we perceive this information? How do layers and a uh, group of neurons give you some information? It does not matter exactly um, the physical principle on how they do that, but how can we replicate those things in a computer program? That's really the key um, concept and I really recommend all of you that are interested in uh, intersection between biology, neuroscience, and artificial vision system to really delve into more literature. Um, for your benefits, I recommend you to read more. Also, keep an eye on these people and labs that really have fascinated me over the years and have fascinated the whole world. Uh, read everything that they have produced recently, listen to their online talks. These people have on lots of online talks and you will be amazed how much more information you can get. You might not be able to understand everything, but if you read their paper and read the reference, um, read some neuroscience and slowly, slowly fill the gaps of what you don't know, you will soon, soon uh, be aware uh, that the neuroscience uh, is a very fascinating field. Um, so some of these names are James DiCarlo from MIT, Tommaso Poggio from MIT, and Thomas Serra from Brown. These are just a few names really of people uh, together, for example, with Christoph Koch and um, um, Van der Heidt at uh, Johns Hopkins. And there's many, many more people that I don't even have time to, uh, to name, but I would really recommend you start with some of these Keep an eye on them and read more um, if you really want to understand how uh, brain can be modeled for artificial visual system.